Thank you, everyone, for coming. We're uh, excited for this panel today. We can sit down. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so we are going to talk about how to move people and goods in a carbon-free world. Uh, just to set the stage, I mean, transportation worldwide is roughly a quarter of carbon dioxide emissions from energy, and that encompasses everything. So actually, uh, less than half of that um, is passenger vehicles, the stuff we always think about, cars, uh, buses, you know, a lot of it is freight, um, aviation is a, is a big sector, moving goods around by ship. So we want to talk a bit about what it looks like to address that huge uh, climate problem. And even though some promising solutions are starting to emerge, like electric vehicles, there are all these other parts of the transportation system that we may need to rethink, look at new technologies, and just try to figure out uh, what the potential solutions are. Um, so I uh, have a great panel here today to uh, discuss everything. Uh, sitting next to me is uh, Laura Lane, the Chief Corporate Affairs Officer at UPS. Um, and then we have Avinash Rugabar, who's uh, president of Arrival, which is trying to rethink uh, electric mobility in cities. We can, we can talk more about that. Uh, we have Amy Damethis, president of uh, New Power at Cummins, which uh, specializes in uh, diesel and alternative fuel engines. And then joining us virtually, we have Peter Vanneker, president and CEO of Nesti, which is, uh, among other things, working on uh, alternative fuels and what, what that might look like. Um, so I think it's going to be a really good discussion. And, um, you know, I think I'll kick off with a, a question to Laura about how UPS is thinking about decarbonizing shipping. I mean, given that you have these huge supply chains, it's going to mean more than just, you know, electric delivery vans moving door to door. Um, so how are you thinking about that, that big picture and, and what a decarbonized shipping system looks like? Yeah. So. Um we are, uh, unfortunately, a big emitter of carbon and have recognized uh, that we needed to take a holistic solution to addressing all the ways in which we deliver for our customers and rethinking how we um, support supply chains. So we made a very bold goal of uh, reducing our carbon and being carbon neutral by 2050. And what we wanted to do was set a very clear path. We wanted to make our commitment with great integrity and so we have looked at uh, the various ways in which we delivered and set targets along the way. So 2025, we are committed to making sure that all of our ground operations operate on 40% alternative fuel. And uh, we have made investments. We're, in fact, one of the biggest investors in renewable natural gas. And we have one of the biggest fleets on the ground, uh, 13,000 alternative fuel vehicles that we've incorporated into our operations. Then, of course, we've recognized that the future is all electric and partnered with this awesome startup uh, arrival that's helping us electrify our fleet. We're going to be taking delivery on 10,000 of the amazing arrival vehicles um, to be able to deliver uh, through electric means uh, on the ground. And then going back to our roots of where we started our operations, which was on the bike. Our company actually started as a messenger service on mm. bikes, and we've been incorporating these cool new solutions, these e-bikes uh, uh, that that um, we've got on display here at COP26. So that's one way in the ground. In the air, we're going to commit to do 30% sustainable aviation fuel in our air operations, recognizing that the big challenge that we have ahead of us is on the technology side. And I'm like, I think maybe we need uh, another arrival in the air, I'm, I'm thinking. But for now, we've got the electric vertical and takeoff and landing vehicles that we're using to supplement our small feeder aircraft. Um, and by 2035, 50% of our small package deliveries will be 50% less CO2 emissions. So those are a lot of the steps that we're taking along the way to take the carbon out, um, recognizing that we're also going to have to innovate a lot and partner with a lot of great companies to find additional solutions ahead. But yeah. we're committed. That gives a, a good overview. I want to get into some of the challenges of making that a reality a bit. But Amy, I want to ask you, so I, I think a lot of people, when we think of decarbonizing transportation, the thing that gets a ton of attention is electrification, electric vehicles. Um, you know, potentially for shorter haul flights, electric airplanes, maybe electric trucks, but it, 
Cummins, it seems like, is looking much more broadly than just electric. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the thinking behind that, why we may not want to be too narrowly focused on, on battery-powered vehicles. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, so Cummins is an over 100-year-old company, and we've been powering all kinds of commercial applications for all of those years. And one of the things we know is it's very diverse. Even UPS, as Laura was saying, has a huge diverse fleet of different kinds of applications that they need. And we just believe that it's not going to take one solution, that um, some applications can fit very well in batteries. And we were talking about the arrival solution and being able to leverage the passenger car learning from batteries into some of those light-duty applications. It's great. We think it's a wonderful solution, and we're going to try to ride that up in lighter applications, applying different battery chemistries to make battery work in the most applications possible. But also, there's a lot of higher power applications, long-haul trucks, mining trucks, um, tr vehicles and equipment that need greater power, greater range, and the ability to operate in all kinds of hot, heavy terrains and things that are not going to live, the batteries won't survive. So we're working on those too because it all needs to be decarbonized. The other thing I would say is I think infrastructure, and we'll probably talk more about that, but charging infrastructure is a challenge for a large fleet. When you think about a heavy truck to put the amount of batteries it would require, just charging one or five trucks at a time is a massive challenge. So hydrogen and fuel cells prevent, present a different opportunity uh, for carrying, storing the energy. And so there's definitely an infrastructure challenge with getting hydrogen available. But if we work at both at the same time, we think we can move faster. And the final thing I would say is diesel engines have come a long way. And so um, we believe that starting now on decarbonizing uh, the solutions that we have today in trucks is really important. So we have partnered with customers like UPS and others on leveraging renewables because uh, we can put those in there now and start making progress as the electrification and the fuel cells really commercialize and get the cost down to become competitive. All right. Uh, so Avinash, I want to ask you, I mean, we've been talking about, and you're obviously working on scaling up electric vehicles. I mean, what do you see as some of the biggest challenges here for, for widespread acceptance? Because they're still a relatively small part of the Yeah, I think, um, <clears throat> I think what we've seen is there's a mind, mind shift, right? So I think we're all here because of that. But if you look at even the market, the dynamics of the market, it's pretty clear that we're moving electric and we're moving zero emission, to your point. Uh, so Arrival, I think we're the baby on the stage. We're, um, we're only six years old. But I really like that video because it was really the ethos of what we're doing, which is if you were to look at today how we produce vehicles, you know, what are the challenges in the mobility ecosystem, would you have designed it that way? And the short answer is as I travel the world, I say no. Right? We have the same vehicles all around the world, regardless of how people move in the cities. There's no optimization going on there. You know, I, I always say if you're in Nairobi, you see the same vehicles that you see in London, you see them in New York, and all these cities move differently. Um, and I think, to, to your point, we're going to need solutions that cross such a big spectrum. So when we looked at the, the reason for this, one of it is the manufacturing process, at least in the, in the urban mobility sector, means that you, produce, you have to produce hundreds of thousands of vehicles of the same type uh, to generate any sort of um, business. And we said, that's not sustainable. It's not sustainable from a, a business perspective. It's not sustainable from... Um, um, a sustainability perspective. So we started from scratch and said, what if you could build vehicles in micro factories, in small, low energy, low um, capex, sorry, I think there's some issues there, sorry, um, factories that are placed near the cities. And to do that, we've had to go and basically break down the fundamentals of the industry, all of these challenges, how we do metal bodies, how we do, uh, so we do have a composite that's fully recyclable, and super cheap and durable, 100% recyclable. Designed all of the components in-house so they're upgradable over time so that the vehicles can be used longer and longer. We've been working with UPS to customize that vehicle. Because we can produce them in lower volumes all around the world, we're able to, we're able to build a vehicle just for UPS, for example. Mm -hmm. 
And so these, these are fundamental challenges of the industry that we've seen in the rollout of electric vehicles. That's why we see so many companies saying that hey, we won't go full electric till you know, 2030, 2040. Well, it needs to happen now. Yep. And to do that, you need to have invested in the technology already, and you need to change the way you think about the industry. You can't take the old approach and just expect to electrify it and say, yeah, that's going to work. Hmm. The old approach got us here. And if we just extrapolate, continuously improve it, it's not going to get us the fundamental shift that the world needs. And that's economies and people everywhere. We can't afford for you know, the US to go green and you know, countries in Asia don't, for example. We need everybody. Yeah. And so it needs a diff fundamentally different approach. Can I, I, I want to uh, get to Pierre next, but I just want to follow up on something you said. Uh, you know, we basically have the same cars everywhere in the world, but cities often look very different. Is there a good example that might help illustrate that, that, that we can think about? That sort of I mean, you know, we, we've, we've just developed a, a whole new bus, and that bus is electric, and it's similar price to fossil fuel uh, buses. Okay. But when, you, when you go around the world, you'll see nice buses in most uh, developed nations, and as soon as you move to developing nations, you're getting the second-hand hand-me-downs that are running there, and they're diesels that have been going for 20-odd years, and they're polluting their cities, and you, know, you see kids driving, riding around on bicycles just in smog. I mean, these are like, the, the whole system's broken, and that's just buses. It's the same with cars. We're, we're doing that. We're creating cars for a certain market, and then we're shipping them over when they're sort of used to other markets, and because of the, the, just the nature of the business, these architectures are lasting 20-odd years, and they're just hacking them together half the time to keep them running. And this is the reality of, of I mean, we can, I don't want to hide behind it. That's literally the industry we're facing. So when we talk about the challenges, it's a fundamental rethink about how we're doing it. How do we make electric vehicles affordable today for everybody across all segments? And that's, to me, how, how we have to change this. Yeah. Uh, so, Peter, I, w I want to talk to you about aviation because that's, uh, it, it's often seen as the hardest challenge in, in decarbonization or one of them, and it gets to so many aspects of transportation, not just you know, people flying to, to cops like this in Glasgow every year, but, but shipping around the world. Um, so, uh, you work a lot, and Nestle works a lot, in, in sustainable aviation fuels, sort of. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of thinking that perhaps in the near term, this may be one of the answers to help reduce emissions from air travel. Uh, but over the past decade, maybe longer, it seems like, my impression at least, is that it's had a hard time scaling up. It's been talked about for a long time, but it has had a hard time scaling up. So I was wondering if you could talk us through what some of those challenges are and what would need to change to make it a, a reality. Uh, Thanks a lot uh, for inviting me. And of course, unfortunately, I couldn't be there in person. Uh, maybe a little bit on the history of, of Nestle. It's a 70 years old company uh, headquartered in Finland. Uh, so if you are in Finland, you always are confronted with the nature. Um, and if you are living in a small country with only five and a half million people, you always have to be innovative as well. So you have this combination of living with the nature, so this attention for sustainability on one hand side, and then having to be innovative on the other hand side. And that has brought companies like, for example, Neste uh, as being global leader in renewable and circular solutions. Um, if you look at the aviation industry, pre-pandemic consumption of kerosene, around 350 million tons of fossil-based kerosene, um, expected to grow in the next 10 to 20 years by about 40%. And yes, we went through a dip, I mean, with the pandemic, but you already see that we are starting to get out of the pandemic, and as a, as a consequence, people start flying again. Um, so we need to do something there. And there has been a lot of discussion around uh, sustainable aviation fuel and what other opportunities do you have in order to decarbonize uh, the aviation industry. Um, but it was a bit of the chicken and the egg. And then we said at Neste, look, we are the global leader in renewable diesel. We have to take up our responsibility. And we started three years ago um, in establishing a dedicated business unit that is focusing on that renewable aviation fuel. Uh, we hire people from the aviation industry, people that know what they are talking about. Um, and uh, we started investing in, in a capacity. 
even if there was not a regulation in place, not in Europe, not in the United States or anywhere else uh, in the world, uh, and kept, kept on going for it. Um, so that today um, we have, I mean, and that's the beauty of the things. I mean, sustainable aviation fuel is not a theory anymore. Uh, there are more than 30, despite the pandemic, more than 30 airlines flying uh, with our sustainable aviation fuel. You may have traveled um, uh, with a plane that was flying with uh, a, certain uh, a certain percentage of, of sustainable aviation fuel um, uh, to COP26. Um, we are available already in more than 20 um, airports across the globe, from Japan uh, to uh, California, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and so on. So this is actually happening. And the beauty of the thing is that with the current technology of sustainable aviation fuels, you don't have to change your air, um, your your supply chain. You don't have to change um, the, uh, the, you know, the, uh, the, the flights, uh, the trajectories, the engines, etc., etc. It's a drop-in solution. And this drop-in solution already today with the current technology provides up to 85% uh, over the life cycle uh, lower um, CO2 emissions. But in addition to that, because it's a pure uh, hydrocarbon, it doesn't have any aromatics in it. It also means that if you're flying on 10,000 meter, uh, you don't have these curtails, yeah? you don't have these plumes, you don't have the particles that eventually have a, um, an impact on uh, our nature, which is 10 times uh, as much as um, the CO2 emissions in terms of greenhouse gas emission impact. So we need to look at it, I mean, also from a holistic point of view that this is not just about CO2 emissions. Now, you talked also about certain challenges. Yes, uh, there is um, uh, quite some challenge. And remarkably, waste is more expensive than crude oil. Yeah, it's a bit strange in the world that we are living that waste is more expensive than crude oil. Uh, so your raw materials are more expensive. Your technology to produce these molecules um, are more expensive. Um, and then, of course, compared to, I mean, to fossil based kerosene current uh, costs to produce sustainable aviation fuel is four to five times uh, more expensive. So something needs to happen also in terms of regulation to really be able, I mean, to scale this up. I see that the aviation industry is really going for it. Uh, the um, skies for tomorrow, clean skies for tomorrow, leading 60 airlines have committed that they want to have a blending of 10% sustainable aviation fuel um, with 90% of fossil based kerosene, of course. Uh, than uh, by 2030. So these things are actually happening. Yeah. Can you just to follow up? Can you talk a bit about what what sustainable aviation fuel entails? Because I know it could be a range. I mean, you can make biofuels from from corn or soy or food, but that you know has a lot of environmental concerns and concerns about crops. It sounds like a lot of the more advanced ones are looking at making it from waste. Yeah. But I don't know if there are constraints in terms of how much waste is available to actually fuel you know, all, all the world's airplanes are a significant number. Yeah, every waste, let's say, or category of waste demands its own uh, process technology. Um, so that's very clear. And we work on all different types of process technologies. Um, we start, of course, with uh, the, the cheapest solution, which is a so-called HEFA technology, whereby you take, I mean, fatty assets as waste. These can be used cooking oils, it can be animal fats, it can be uh, fish oils whatsoever. Um, that you take as a starting component and then you go through your process and what you get as um, the output is a, a pure hydrocarbon. Um, so no aromatics, as I said before. Um, of course, you can also take municipal solid waste. So you actually, every carbon source that you have, you can, with a dedicated process technology, extract that carbon, hydrogenate it and make a hydrocarbon out of it. So if it is the source is municipal solid waste or if we are talking about forestry wastes, and residues, or if we talk about CO2 capturing out of the air, uh, or CO2 that is coming out of steel mills or refineries and so on, that then through an electrolysis process, the so-called power to liquid technology, you can also have the same drop in molecule solutions uh, as uh, the output, let's say, of the technology. So different technologies have, of course, their, their, their different, let's say, readiness. Uh, the HEFA technology is ready, is in the market right now. Um, it will take a bit of time on municipal solid waste uh, and linear cellulosics, so forestry waste, uh, and even more time if we talk about algae technologies or if we talk about 
um, the power to liquid technology until these technologies were economically feasible and scalable. Got it, got it. Uh, Laura, I want to go back to you. We've been talking a lot about technology, you mm -hmm. know, whether we, we power planes with new types of fuels, electric vehicles, uh, but there's also this sort of uh, how we think about moving goods and people around. And so in, in cities, you know, it's, it's not just electric vehicles, it's also thinking about uh, public transportation and, and building cities in different ways to allow people to walk and bike. Is that, is that sort of rethinking the shift in how we actually move goods and services around part of what UPS is thinking about in addition to the technological side? Absolutely. And I wanted to answer uh, one question related to the aviation fuel yeah, because yeah, I yeah, think it's fine. really important to, um, to flag this. We operate in 220 countries and territories and you'd think, oh my gosh, we've got to have sustainable aviation fuel in all these different locations. By the way, we've been doing tremendous amount of air movements in the middle of the pandemic. We're going to deliver a billion vaccines by December 6th, and all of those movements have had to occur by air to get them to all 100 countries that we've now delivered to. But what's the cool fact is we really only need sustainable aviation fuels in 15 airports around the world to be able to serve this global marketplace to address about 80% of our refueling needs. And so if we could really focus government efforts on ensuring that there's sufficient supply in those 15 airports, and this is for UPS operations. Right, this is 15 worldwide. Worldwide airports, we could cut, uh, uh, we could address most of our um, sustainable aviation fuel needs in 80% of our movements um, just in those 15 locations. So it's, 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 it's an interesting fact to think about because sometimes these problems seem so large and we're trying to help government policymakers really focus their energies in specific areas so that you can deliver the biggest impact. So now, now thinking about how we're rethinking how we're delivering, especially in city centers, um, we're saying, how are we part of the solution rather than part of the problem? How do we lower our emissions in these city centers? How, by the way, are we part of not being uh, a contributor to the congestion and some of the frustration that people feel when they have to work around all these big trucks? And so we've been looking at really um, helping change customer behaviors in terms of how we deliver. We've set up access points, for example, all across cities so that customers can say, hey, it's probably more convenient for me to go to an access point and I can have three or four packages that are being delivered to me today sent to one locations rather than five different trucks delivering, um, you know, to my home throughout the day. We're also looking at ways to... Um, um, you know, use e-cycle solutions, which I talked about, and we've got them on display at the landing, finding ways to go uh, so that we're not adding another truck on the road, but we're having staging centers where all the packages get delivered, and then e-bike solutions are used to deliver the packages in city centers. And so those are just two of the examples of the innovations that we're using, in addition to, you know, the partnership that we've got with Arrival about how to really drive electric electric solutions um, in, uh, in the cities. One other innovation that I think is super, super cool is think about the power needs that we would have as we move to a fully electric fleet. And, and I know you were touching on this too, Amy. How, do you, how are you smart about the energy that you draw? We've got smart grid technologies that we're using now to really... Um, uh, use the power at the right times throughout the day and really be efficient about our um, uh, electric draw so that it's balanced and we're, how should I say, being good community partners in terms of drawing on the power when we need it, yet not taking it from other um, entities that need it at specific times during the the day. Yeah. And so um, it's all those kinds of different innovations that are coming together and helping us rethink how we can be customer first, people led and innovation driven in all that we do. Yeah. So just to follow up, so those access points, I mean, if I'm going out and, um, you know, at least in the US, most cities are obviously uh, car dependent. If I'm going out and 
driving to go get my package that was dropped off at an access point. I mean, is that necessarily more efficient well, than? We're, we're trying to make it so it's really convenient for you. So if it's right by your office, you're just popping down by your office as before you're heading home. Yeah, um, and back so in the days of offices. Yeah. 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 Oh, or, <laughs> or it's, you know, maybe at the local grocery store and you're able to pick up, um, you know, what you're doing and kind of saving the extra trips because it's all in one place. Yeah. Obviously, we're also trying to... Um, uh, help customers see the importance of um, grouping their deliveries together so that we're only sending one vehicle, um, you know, once a day uh, to your house rather than multiple times and thinking about it in those kind of creative ways. Yeah, I mean, all these different measures, uh, and as Peter said, you know, sustainable aviation fuel can have extra costs. Some of these other measures can potentially have extra costs. I mean, is uh, how is UPS thinking about this? Is it that if, you know, something is too expensive you know, well, it's not required by policy, so that might not be something we, we jump into right away. Is it only looking at decarbonization solutions that knows can save money? I, I mean, I, I, at the end of the day, UPS is all about efficiency, right? Because yeah. with efficiency, you drive down costs. And so we've been an efficiency and engineering-driven kind of company um, for the 100-plus years that we've been in existence. Um, but we do recognize we have a responsibility to be good stewards of the environment. And so sometimes there are added costs to some of the innovations that we are introducing into our network, but that's where the public-private partnership comes into play. That's where we're working with governments to say, help us be able to develop these new, new solutions in partnership with you so that because of our scale, we can ultimately help drive down the cost overall for the industry so that the the smaller and medium-sized players that um, you know we would want to also be availing themselves of these sustainable solutions can then afford them down the road. We see ourselves as important partners with governments in this regard, incubators of new technologies, so that these amazing arrival vehicles that we're going to be um, you know taking delivery on next year can also be the kinds of vehicles that others in the industry can use too at more cost-effective price points. Yeah. Um, Avinash, I want to um, ask you kind of the same question I asked Laura about, about cities and getting around. I mean, it's, it, it seems like it may not be the future in a carbon-free world. It's just doing everything we do today, but replacing, you know, gasoline, diesel vehicles with uh, electric. So, so how's Arrival thinking about how, yeah. how we rethink and, and getting it's a, around? It's a great question because I don't think it's just recreating what we have today in, in zero carbon or... or electric. Um, interestingly, and, and Laura is touching on this, when we look at the efficiencies that we need to drive in, as we move people and goods, data is critical here. And we need to be able to have access to the right data at the right time. So one of the things that we're making sure that we're doing is our vehicles are fully connected to the point where you can tell in any system what is happening in real time and you're able to do things like predictive maintenance. You know when that vehicle, you know, we're working with UPS on this, you know when that vehicle may have an issue, you bring it in, you fix it. A driving a level of customization into the vehicle, so it's really fit for purpose, because otherwise it's inefficient. If you look at, um, uh, we'll take a delivery van, if you look at the delivery van and you haven't even thought about the way the shelvings all need to be placed in the vehicle, you're driving inefficiencies, so to do that, you need to have a very customizable uh, production method, right? And that allows you, and the technology platforms, that allow you to build that customization in. So as you extrapolate that over time, we work directly with cities, like we're working with the city of Charlotte right now, to say, okay, if we can design any type of vehicles that you need, let's go collect some data and see how people are really moving. You know, we've always had this sort of, at least, you know, coming up in the auto industry, we always had these discussions like, why do we have you know, five-seater passenger vehicles when most of the time it's one or two people? Yeah. And the reality is we still haven't designed that Jetson mobile, you know, with the one person sitting in there. Obviously, that was flying too, but, you know, on the ground at least, we haven't designed those sorts of products. It's the same stuff everywhere, <laughs> right? Regardless of how people use it. And, and, and um, when we think about where the future of cities need to go, it needs to be, what is the right type of bus? London, as iconic as that double-decker bus, it's about 30% utilized. Efficiency again, cost, yes. environmental impact. But if we were to say, what is the right product? 
Well, that's on us, that's on the industry to help create flexible systems to say, okay, you need this type of bus with this many seats, here it is, or, or this shape. You know, Laura, what else do you want to carry? Yeah. What's the type of form factors you need? What, maybe you have odd packages that never seem to be, be able to be delivered efficiently. Is there enough of that we can create you know, a low volume run of those types of vehicles? And that's where data and you know, public partnerships, private partnerships, data and technology innovations, that's why it's coming up so much here because again, if we recreate the way we've always done it, we won't, we won't be able to do any of these things. And so, that's how we think about it. And you know what I was going to say is what I love about the vehicles too is they're taking in all the data from our drivers. We have drivers who have been driving safely with our company for 25 and 30 years. So they're doing a lot of repetitive things. Yeah. And you all have been designing those vehicles to be ergonomic yeah. and really taking the driver into account as well as all the data that ensures that we're, how should I say, taking the most efficient routes whenever we're delivering. We're known for only taking a certain uh, kind of turn um, because we want to minimize fuel utilization, idling at stoplights, and these vehicles allow us to have the most efficient routing so we're not driving extra miles. And in fact, UPS drove three, three billion miles um, in a year. A billion of those have been greener miles, and we've got all these technology solutions that, in effect, save us from driving extra miles, which exactly. are green miles if you consider those not driven to be green too. The savings, yeah, so, yeah. absolutely. Just to follow up, do I, I, I feel like I've heard this before, UPS drivers try to avoid doing left-hand turns because yeah. it takes and too I, long. And I wanted and to say left or right, but I oh, remember yeah, well, we're, we're, we're in the UK. Here it would be and, right, so, yeah, 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 that's right. So, um, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, Amy, I want to ask a little more about the infrastructure challenge. I mean, I, there are huge infrastructure challenges in, in, for electric vehicles. We need chargers everywhere. We need to upgrade the grid to handle that power. It seems like hydrogen, which you mentioned, has even bigger challenges where an entirely new infrastructure has to be built, not just to make the hydrogen, but to deliver it, to store it, all of this. I mean, does it seem like hydrogen is just too far behind to ever catch up? Or is it a, a place where it might be able to, to compete in places where electric just isn't suitable? Like you mentioned long haul trucking, the batteries might be too big. Yeah, I mean, I would just remind us that we use hydrogen today. So there's yeah. a lot of hydrogen produced today. Although um, most of that is natural gas and Most of that a comes from natural gas through yeah. steam, methane reforming, absolutely. But to make that green, to convert that to green, that's starting to happen now. People are looking at where industries where they use hydrogen, um, how do they decarbonize that? And that's happening quite quickly and now. But the concept of using hydrogen for mobility and getting it delivered and available for fueling stations and other things is absolutely a huge challenge. But I would just point out that I think the big challenge that we have collectively really for mobility is renewable energy generation sources. Because at the end of the day, it all starts there. What, whatever is, is powering your charging station, if it's not green, it's sort of ruining the point. So I, this is a big, it needs to be a big push at a, a conference like this to be pushing our countries to be looking. And it, we've made huge progress, by the way, uh, in, in many countries in, in moving to renewable energy sources, but that's gonna be primary, whether it's hydrogen or battery um, charging stations, whether if they need to be powered by renewable fuels. In the hydrogen space, um, we've invested in electrolysis. So this is technology that can take, using renewable energy sources, can take um, water and convert it and break it down into hydrogen. And the costs are coming down quite quickly in this technology. And what's really interesting about it is it's quite scalable. So you, we have today these kinds of electrolysis that can go right into a fueling station. So they can drop in, they're the right size for a refueling station. We have several of these kind of refueling stations operating today around the world in places like ports and other places where you can um, do fueling right, right there on site. Um, as the costs come down, that will make more sense. Obviously the costs are quite high to do that today. But it can also be scaled to large scale um, electrolysis operations, and this can be done, and I think people are, are already investing in these kinds of operations where there's renewable energy. So you'll see 
a big uh, project in Niam in the Middle East where they're looking at uh, leveraging the, um, the, the huge solar power uh, capabilities there and exporting that all around the world. So it's happening, people are investing in it, and I'm really excited about the announcements that European, the European Union, European countries individually, um, frankly China, and now in the infrastructure bill in the US, they've also really uh, put money towards this hydrogen infrastructure build out, which is gonna be really important for these hard to uh, electrify applications like long haul truck. Even though I think people will reinvent trucking, there are certain applications in certain locations around the world that just need a different kind of power solution. I agree. Mm -hmm. um, that's interesting. So I want to get to some audience questions before the session ends. And I don't know if we have questions coming from online or in person, but um, people should feel free to raise their hands and ask questions, and we'll bring a mic around if anyone does. If not, I will uh, ask more questions. We have one back there, yeah. Hi there. Uh, Robin Clark from Just Eat or Grubhub, if you're in the US. Um, our drivers are independent couriers, uh, in, by the most part, driving well over about two and a half billion miles. The challenge for us, particularly in scope three, is um, accelerating the adoption of EV for second hand. Mm -hmm. um, the, the large part of investment is in, of course, new vehicles. Help. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, is that the question or just the yeah. state? <laughs> <No. laughs> um, if you don't mind, I'll. I'll yeah. So the, the issue is right now currently with the current electric vehicles that are on offer is there's a price differential, as you know, right? So they're, they're more expensive. Um, and fundamentally, the sort of value proposition is that the TCO, the total cost of ownership over a long period of time will come down enough that it makes sense. But if you're the single fleet owner and you're the career, that doesn't help you, right? It's, it's, it's not gonna help you get into an electric vehicle. So that's the pain point that you mentioned, and, and we're extremely aware of that. And one of the things that we're doing at Arrival is making that initial purchase at a similar price to the fossil fuel one. Because to me, that's the inflection point, right? When you can go out and you can say, and I'll, I'll come to your point particularly, because that's the second-hand market, but in the primary market, when, you, when this fir first purchase, if you can go and say, I can buy diesel, or I can buy electric, and it's the similar price, and this one, the electric one, is gonna be cheaper to run, it's a better vehicle, I get more cargo capacity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, then you're, you're shifting over, right? And we're seeing that right now, that, that, that curve is happening right now. So then what's important is once we've got the initial price down, then it's gonna to turn to the business models, right? Knowing that over a period of time, there is a payback. Knowing that the initial purchase price is similar, now we've created a better business model. And then it comes to being able to bring, bring that as an innovation to folks in the second-hand market. Like, you can get in, what's your current, whether it's a leasing model, a per mile model, that's where the economics makes sense to then start doing that, knowing that in, in an arrival vehicle also you can upgrade it over time. So we can do things like say, you know, we'll guarantee a buyback, for example, right? Because we know what that residual value will be. Comes back to arrival, we upgrade it, and we bring it back out. And so these are the solutions that need to, need to come for the second-hand market because it won't transition over and then we're going to end up, what we were talking about earlier, with you know, all types of vehicles on the road because or we've created another haves and have-nots mm -hmm. and we need equitable solutions here. We do. So we are really focused on this, this problem. First step, as I mentioned, get the price to be similar. That turns the next set of purchases over to electric. Then you take that and the business model changes. You see if we can guarantee some residual value or create a leasing model or a per mile model because we know it's cheaper to run and then we offer that to everybody. And, and, and you know, we also gonna know that the key cost right now is the battery and the battery costs are coming down rapidly as well. So we believe Arrival will come out with competitive pricing and at some point, you know, I don't wanna promise this, but at some point, I, 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 was, I will actually, I want to get cheaper than fossil fuels with, with with electric vehicles. And yeah, and I hope, hopefully that answers your question. I'd also like to just jump in quickly because I, I think that um, these kinds of transitions drive all kinds of innovation as um, our friends at Arrival are 
are just examples of this. It's happening in the aftermarket too. The, um, as batteries, the costs come down, but also they become more modular. So one of the, the challenges of batteries in all of these kind of applications is packaging. How do you load them on and package them in these different kinds of vehicle sizes? So as they become more modular, as we get more sophisticated in how we package them, the aftermarket solutions become a lot more nimble and easier to apply. And we have a large scale distribution system at Cummins. There's a lot of dealers, there's a lot of innovators out there that are actually um, starting to look at how do we uh, refurb and, and electrify the stuff that's out there today. Can I, can I just follow on and say thank you? Because uh, yeah. we're filling in the jigsaw pieces and to guarantee a purchase of the second hand car, that's clearly the way we have to think. That's yeah. great. Uh, over there I see a hand. Thank you. Thanks very much for this great session. Uh, David Clayton from Kaya in London. Can I just ask, firstly on the learning curves point, and just, just how quickly is technology progressing? Because I'm a bit concerned that we're trying to think about EV infrastructure with yesterday's battery technology, but as you <laughs> leap in range, question. you start to solve the need to have charging density, first question. But my big question really is, this debate on e-fuels, I mean, is it not a way to hang on to old internal combustion engine technologies and old transport technologies? Is, is this not just a way to say, you know, let's just kick this into the future and not worry about innovating solutions? Um, well, that's a, a bunch of questions. Uh, Peter, maybe I'll ask you about the e-fuels real quick, and then we'll get to the, the other one um, about learning curves. You know, our... Go on. One thing that we may not forget is that uh, the big elephant on our table is uh, not the internal combustion engine, but it is 900 million tons of fossil-based raw materials that are being consumed for transportation. And we need to be open for different types of technologies because we need to address that big elephant that we have at the table. And we don't have time to wait 10, 15, 20, 25 years until everybody is going electric. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, I also believe that when we talk very positively uh, about electric vehicles, and don't get me wrong because I have one myself, um, but there are also deficiencies and questions that we need to answer with electric vehicles and the batteries and where their raw materials come from the batteries and how do we get them, what about labor, child labor, uh, what about the huge amounts of water that you need uh, how sustainable is that? And what about the, the circularity around the batteries? Now, how can we close that loop as well? Um, E-fuels, I do believe personally, are um, a very important um, part of the solution for the future. Uh, because on one hand side, uh, when we're talking about an internal combustion engine, um, there are certain segments, of course, that will be extremely difficult, I mean, to decarbonize and to move to electrification of our fuel cells. Uh, so what do we do, I mean, with those engines in the meantime? Um, then on the other hand side, you need, you need it's all about um, energy um, um, density um, of, of the different solutions that you have. That's why I don't see, I mean, intercontinental flights, for example, um, flying any, any, any soon, I mean, on hydrogen. Uh, you need to completely redesign your, your, your flight because your energy density of hydrogen is, is, is not high enough. Um, and if you make a hydrocarbon out of it, of course, you get much more higher uh, energy density. So therefore, um, you can immediately put it into existing engines. Um, and you don't have to redesign your engine, you don't have to redesign your plane, etc., etc. The same is in road transportation as well, in heavy duty transportation, just as an example. So I don't see this really as, okay, no, we're trying to find another way uh, so that we don't have to electrify. Um, I think we just need to be very open for the different types of technologies and address the climate crisis, I mean, as soon as possible. Can, can, can I, I pick up? Oh, can I pick up? Oh, oh, yes. Well, I was just going to say, yeah. we have this uh, debate internally at Cummins, as you can imagine, all the time. Mm -hmm. I run this division that is completely zero emission, zero carbon. That's what we focus on. We only talk about that. And then there's this other division that's in a uh, different um, you know, state that, that's really doing these internal combustion. And we're talking about renewable fuels and how, how impact that can make today. And I think um, the points that were made are really important because if you put carbon out there tomorrow or next week, you can't take it back. And so the way we're thinking about it at Cummins is um, 
they're available, renewable fuels are available right now, and there's internal combustion engines, too many of them available now. So you can take carbon out now. And by the way, if you do that now, that's great, because if you put it out, it, you don't get it back. Um, and then, but it's very transitionary. At least the way we think about it is it's a transition, and if you use it now, and if you get some reason to do it now, it can make an impact, but let's get the technologies going down the cost curve to get that transition end date sooner. So it's kind of the combination in my mind of bringing those I two agree. endpoints together. Yeah. I'm totally gonna agree with totally you, Amy, agree. because that's exactly how we're looking at it. We don't wanna make the fuel the enemy. We wanna have the focus be on the emissions reduction. And so we wanna have a rolling laboratory of all possible solutions. And so really taking a technology neutral approach, trying all kinds of different technologies that can bring the emissions down and experimenting with it all. And uh, I love the fact that Peter also brought out the point with all of the technologies that we're developing and looking to um, deploy within our fleet, we're also looking at that social impact. Because we're not doing this just for the environmental um, implications. We're doing it for our people and the communities that we serve. And the supply chains that go into development of all of these new technologies also have to be sustainable and good for people. And so... Um, um, I couldn't agree with you more, Amy, in that we want it to be we want it to be transitional with the end goal being zero emissions and whatever innovations can get us there, UPS wants to be investing and experimenting with them and accelerating their use at scale around the world as quickly as possible. Bringing the cost down so those secondhand markets are available uh, for others to be able to have that just access to. Yeah, and, and, and I would also agree. I think, I think the heart of the question is, is it a crutch that we will rely on, right? Is it something that will say, we've got these e-fuels and now we don't have to think about anything else? And to your point, when carbon's out there, it's out there. So better we start now because it's available. And you know, to Peter's point, we've got a huge issue in, in, in lithium production and, and batteries, right? We need to go and solve that as a whole industry because you know, I would say it's kind of like a secret of the industry. We talk about the sell forward. And if you look at the cell backwards, it's really messy. And we do have to go and clean that up. And when we talk about will we stop innovating though, and you know, to your other question on the S-curve, absolutely not. Because there, are, there is the next generation of engineers and innovators coming through. They will not even join your company. Unless you know, they are forcing you to make a difference. I mean, we did it, you know, that was just us. That was who we wanted to be when we formed Arrival. But you've got hundreds of years old companies that I'm sure you guys are seeing that. You know, we've got um, shareholder pressure, which is what is your ESG strategy? But ultimately, I want to believe like, that we're all humans and we all see that we've got a problem on our hands and we are going to need to solve it. So I don't think it's going to stop the, the innovation. The innovation is happening. It's, it's in progress right now. You're going to see that you know, we're in production next year. You're going to see these things come out. And once it starts, it's just... It's so rapid, you don't see it. It's like before cell phones and after cell phones. And it's going to be a little murky in the early years as there's a transition, but it's coming. I mean, absolutely it's coming. You know, 75% of our workforce is millennials, and they want to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. So I, I, I share that optimism that that innovation is going to keep going. So I think we have time for one more quick question, and you had your hand up earlier, yeah. Thanks very much. Um, Patrick Handy from Brunswick. Um, it, 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 what's interesting about listening to this is there doesn't seem to be as any antagonism or sort of competition between different um, energy sources. It sounds as if you're describing a world where different uses require very different sources and therefore there's, there, 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 there will be multiple applications. I, I notice incidentally nobody's referred to the fact there isn't yet a battery-driven tractor and therefore there's going to be something fairly significant about, uh, about a fuel source for, for the farming industry. Mm. However, kerosene, petrol, diesel, all of those have a distribution model which is very, very common, very interlinked, and has been driven down to very low cost. Are we not looking at a very, very big capital investment to have multiple fuel sources for multiple modes of transport? And, and how is that understood in terms of just how much it's actually going to cost? 
Uh, Amy, you want to, and we've got to be quick about this, but yeah. uh, big so question, but yeah. It is, and I, I think it's really important that the oil and gas companies get on board. We are finding many of them are. We're talking to a lot of them about the hydrogen infrastructure and how they can play a part, leveraging their pipelines. So is there a way to use this massive infrastructure that's already built and, and use it to distribute hydrogen, and is that a way to really accelerate the hydrogen infrastructure? I think there is. I think there's some possibility there. Um, you, you, I mean, I think it's a really great point that you raise. I think it's, um, it is the puzzle of it all, these applications coming together using different technologies. But if the uh, pipelines and that infrastructure, that fueling infrastructure that we know today can be leveraged for hydrogen, it's a huge breakthrough. Uh, well, we are out of time. This was great. Thank you so much all for showing up and the great questions. Thank you to our panelists, Laura, mm -hmm. Avinash, uh, mm -hmm. Amy, and uh, Peter. Thank you for joining us virtually. Uh, this was really great. And stay around the Climate Hub all day. There will be more great discussions and panels. Thank you. Thank you.